Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and I'd like to welcome you to genetics. In this session, we're going to explore the concept, the concept of gene linkage. And later we're going to apply that to how to do gene mapping. But in this talk, we really want to come to the bottom of this whole idea of linkage, which we've really not discussed before. Although you're going to see that we've discussed some things that sort of might have gotten you thinking about this possibility anyway. So I think you'll agree that we have decided that in a normal dihybrid cross, and when I say that, I mean a dihybrid cross is what it is, but if it's of the form of two double heterozygotes, which is how we've been doing it a good amount of the time all along, big A, little a, big B, little b, for example, you guys know that we're going to have a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio if we do the cross that way. And that's because of independent assortment. In fact, remember that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio was the evidence that in fact independent assortment does take place. Now over the last couple of sessions we've been looking at some seeming exceptions which we realized were really extensions of Mendel's laws and all of those have led us to a little bit of a deeper understanding as I say here of how genes can exert their influence in seemingly different ways without breaking the laws. In other words, they always do this within the context of what Mendel said in his first and second laws. So this really is another seeming exception. We're going to really examine this seeming exception because it's very, very powerful, not only in terms of understanding what's going on, but in terms of actually allowing us to be able to physically map genes onto chromosomes. Remember, there's been this sort of dynamic and dichotomy all along in the sense that Mendel knew about the information and the genes. We then realized that the genes were physically located on chromosomes. And these two concepts are really, really going to be coming together in this lecture or this session. Now, I'm going to give you an actual cross that was done and you could do it, I guess, if you wanted to, that illustrates what we're talking about here. So using Drosophila, and there's a reason we're using Drosophila, this phenomenon was discovered in the fruit fly, and there's a good reason why it was well, in a minute. So remember how fly geneticists do this. They tend to name ge genetic loci based on the mutation that they discovered. So in this case, PR for purple, is a mutation. We saw the white-eyed mutation before. Well, this actually causes purple eyes. Okay. Um, PR plus. Now, you could say PR plus or you could just say plus, but that's the wild type. And I'm sure you remember that the normal wild type color for eyes in the fruit fly is red. And as you would expect, you can't always assume it, but it's pretty much always true in these cases that the wild type plus mutation is dominant to this purple PR uh, mutation. VG is a completely separate non-allelic gene. It's a mutant allele that causes so-called vestigial wings. Vestigial sort of means that they're not very well formed and they certainly don't work. These flies can't fly, which is a bit ironic. VG plus, or just plus, depending on how you want to write it, is the wild type. And what that means is just normal wings that work properly. The normal situation is dominant to the vestigial situation. So what we want to do is set up a cross, as I'm saying, as we always do, meaning that we're going to start with pure breeding lines. But instead of doing how Mendel did when he formulated the law of independent assortment, Instead of selfing the F1, we're going to do a test cross, and there's a very definite reason for this. As we're about to see, when you do a test cross, it's going to actually allow you to see what's going on with the gametes in one of the parents. Let's see how that's true. So here's the cross diagrammed out the way we usually do it. These are um, genes that we're assuming are independent, we're assuming are going to assort independently. So we have a pure breeding line has to be homozygous for P1 
PR plus, which means the wild type, which means red eyes. This I was going to say this person, this fly has. VG plus, VG plus is pure breeding for normal type wings, right? This is the parental generation. Then we're going to cross it with, you know, in this case, we would say a double mutant. If we were using pea plants, you know, it would just be the recessive trait. But these mutations are recessive. So little PR, little PR means that you have purple eyes. And little VG, little VG means you have vestigial wings. So if you do this cross, it shouldn't be too shocking as to what happens. And that is because you'll probably recognize without doing a big old Punnett square, although you could if you wanted to, that the only gametes that this uh, parent can offer are a PR plus and a VG plus. And the only gametes this parent can offer are little PR, little VG. So when you put them together, you're going to get PR plus PR, a heterozygote at the eye color allele, and VG plus VG, a heterozygote at the wing allele. Now, because of the dominance of the wild type traits, all of the F1 are going to appear phenotypically red-eyed and normal winged, right? The wild type. This is not at all shocking that all the F1 are double heterozygotes, right? We've seen this over and over again. Now, if we were to cross this with itself, you would expect a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, right? But as I said, we're going to do a test cross instead. So let's see how that would work out. It's actually easier than the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, but you have to adjust your thinking a little bit if that's what you're used to doing. So we're going to take this F1 individual, which is phenotypically red-eyed and normal winged, but remember it's a double heterozygote, and we're going to test cross it. Don't forget the definition of a test cross, whether it's one locus or whether it's two or ten. You're crossing something that's heterozygous. Well, we framed it originally as crossing something exhibiting the dominant trait with something that's totally recessive so that you could figure out what that genotype was. We know the genotype here, but the reason we're cross doing a test cross is because this individual here, they om only, no matter what, can make gametes like this, right? So since whatever gametes this individual makes are going to be meeting up with this type of a gamete, really what we're doing is we're seeing what gametes are being made over here. Now, if you think of it in the, the normal way, what gamete types should we be able to expect from this, from this double heterozygote right here? Well, it should be all four possible types, right? PR plus VG plus, PR plus VG, PR VG plus, and PR VG. Just as if you were doing the, you know, the dihybrid cross Punnett square, you'd have all four of those on one side. Now, if you were crossing it by times itself, you'd have all four of those on the other side as well. But since we're doing a test cross, you guys know that double heterozygote, I'm not sure why it's snuck outside the circle there. All it can make is that, is that uh, gamete right there. So what you would expect is, look, there's a one-fourth chance that this one will meet up with this, or this will meet up with this, or this, or this. So if you put it all together, you expect it's a little bit wordy or clumsy, but it's a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio, meaning that one quarter of the offspring will be each of the possible phenotypic uh, classes based on, really, as you see, while, of course, this parent is contributing, it's always contributing the same thing. So it's really the other parent, the double heterozygote, that's creating the, the diversity in this F2, which is down here, right? So wouldn't you expect, maybe this is the best way to do it. From this double, heteros, double homozygote parent, excuse me, you're always getting this half of the, of the equation here. It's not really an equation, but that's always coming. It's the same in every single...